Okay, so my name's Mia and I'm a sustainable textile designer. Um, I specialize in regenerating textiles that are either organic, secondhand, um, gifted from friends, family, and I regenerate these textiles using a process called natural dyeing. Um, my whole process with my business is the sort of make, do and mend mentality. Um, I offer different workshops on how to dye fabric using natural dyes um, and how to make dyes out of ingredients that you can forage, that you can find in your garden, kitchen cupboards, um, or sort of down at the beach. I use different rusted metals to hand dye things as well. Um, so besides doing different natural dye workshops, today the main workshop I'm gonna be focusing on is um, mending and stitching. But before I get to that, I sort of will go through with you my background um, and different things that you can sort of learn about um, the power of sustainability and how you can use items that might be classed as rubbish as something that can be made into something more beautiful. Oh, so yes, hello, my name is Mia. Um, I was a little intro just there as to who I am and what I'm up to. Um, so some of the services um, that I offer um, sort of covered it briefly. Um, I'm very proud to say that everything is naturally hand dyed, it's biodegradable, um, meaning that it's either recyclable or has been recycled um, and all of the processes involved from the start to the finish of the production um, is ethical and eco-friendly. So Covering bits of my education, um, where I first started um, at school, um, I know that a few people here are a range of ages, so I'm going to cover it sort of from start to finish, just so you can get an idea of um, how you can progress in a creative study, and if not, um, how different pathways can sort of suit to your different skill sets. So at school, um, for A-levels, um, sorry, for GCSE, I did music, art and drama. Um, I always knew that I was more aligned with the creative studies and um, so I always focused on these three as like core subjects that were sort of my favourite ones to do. Um, and while doing those I sort of, I got to a point where I loved all of them equally and I wasn't too sure which one to sort of do when I was choosing my A-levels. Um, I went to school in Essex and decided to change my location completely and go to college to do my A-levels in Cambridge. Um, when I first started college, um, I got to a point where I'd been doing music, art and drama. I knew that I wanted to travel. Um, I was into photography and I really enjoyed English language as well. Um, so when I started my A-levels, I actually chose subjects because I wanted to be a photographer for David Attenborough <laughs> and I wanted to travel the world and see different bits of wildlife. Um, so when I first did my A-levels, I did English, um, media and journalism, photography um, and design. Um, so when I first started college, I did these A-levels for about two weeks when I first started. Um, and when I started into the second week it everything about how I felt towards my practice and what I did just didn't feel right um so I spoke to the people at college and I asked if I could switch courses um my friend she was doing the art diploma um and everything about it sounded very enticing and very intriguing and it was exactly kind of what I thought I wanted to be doing um so Amazingly, I spoke with the college after my second week of starting my A-levels and they let me switch to a diploma. Um, the reason I'm telling you this, even though it might not seem relevant to where my career is now, if anything, it was actually such a profound moment that I was able to think that something didn't feel right and look at my other options in the same college and see where I could go that would make me feel more happier. And it's also like a little lesson just to remind yourself that each decision you make isn't the final decision and it's not the end of the world and it can change and you know you are the creator of your path so try and not put too much pressure on yourself when you're choosing different courses or career paths to go down. So luckily I went into the art diploma where 
you spend two years focusing on photography, painting, sculpture, um, textiles, um, drawing, um, all the different creative mediums. Um, and then within your final project, within the final second year, you choose what subject you enjoyed the most. And for my case, that was textiles. Um, so finding sort of my passion in textiles, um, I worked heavily in embroidery. Um, I really enjoyed doing like fine beadwork and stitching. Um, and as I was sort of progressing through college, um, I always thought to myself that I wasn't going to go to university. Um, I'm not sure why I thought that. I just felt that maybe I didn't suit it or that I would be able to find a job um, in an embroidery place that I would be able to then work in. Um, so towards my final year in college, we then were given opportunities to go and view some universities with our classmates. And I decided to go and visit Norwich University of the Arts. And the day that I spent there just completely opened my mind to a world that I didn't even know was sort of possible. I've always sort of been in um, sort of Essex, Cambridge area. And even though Norwich isn't too far, it was far enough for me to realise that my world was quite small at that time and that I could really expand and meet other creative people and learn different things in the creative industry. So I decided to apply um, at Norwich University of the Arts and I got in and I did textile degree. So while I was at university, um, I was on a three year course and um, the first year definitely opened my eyes to what I thought I wanted to do. Um, like I mentioned, I was heavily focused in embroidery and stitching and mark making on fabrics. Within the first year of university, it was quite similar to the art diploma where you get to experiment with all different types of mediums um, and the facilities that they have in the university. So in my case, that was weaving, screen printing, um, printmaking as well. So not just screen printing, but also lino printing, which is a process where you um, cut bits of lino, you roll it with ink, and then you press it onto fabric or paper, and then you can make patterns out of that. Um, I also looked into dyeing as well. So um, the university had facilities where they um, did chemical dyeing um, to learn how to dye different bits of fabric. So within the first and second year, I was just really interested in creating colour. And when I first actually started, because I was interested in stitching and mark making, I then went down the route of printmaking where I would do marks on um, a print and then I could put that onto fabric, whether it would be digitally printed or hand printed. Um, I started really enjoying this process and learning about how different colours can be made using different uh, ingredients um, and recipes. And it was within my second year that I started focusing more on sustainability um, because we were taught how to dye fabric and do screen printing with chemical dyes. Um, and then after the day would be finished, we'd wash them all up, um, put them down the sink. And it got to a point where just something didn't feel right um, that we were washing away all these chemicals down the sink. So I decided to take it upon myself um, and do some research into other dye alternatives, um, one of them being natural dyes. Um, and this kind of put me into a rabbit hole of just learning so much about colour. Um, and this is where I'm getting to on this slide. I'm talking about like the importance of sampling. So when you're at university or whichever course you might be doing, whether that's at college or at school, um, sometimes me personally, I felt like I always had to have an end goal, like a final piece. Um, but through learning about how to experiment, I've actually started to discover that it's actually the sampling in itself that can actually be your final piece. And it's the documentation and the learning. So it's always about the journey that you're on, not always sort of the end goal. So something that really helped during sort of my creative studies is learning how to find what interests me. So when you first start a degree or a different subject, you know, the options are so, so wide as to what you can focus on. Sometimes it can be quite overwhelming to know where you begin or what you start with. 
Um, and looking back on this, the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody starting any sort of uh, course, even new career, um, maybe starting a business is to first and foremost, think about yourself and who you are and the things that interest you. So in my case, I've always been growing up with charity shopping, um, upcycling bits of furniture. Um, I love going to a festival and meeting new people and just sort of being outdoors and also talking to people about the things that I've learned. So through doing this and understanding this about myself, it really led me to know what processes were best for me as a creative and maybe you can imply this into sort of your own practice as to you know what interests you it might be animals it might be motorsports it could be anything you know one of your hobbies or it doesn't have to be a hobby it could be a feeling that you have and if you want to implement that with what you're focusing on then I really recommend that because it's quite beneficial so when I was deciding all of this and having revelations about who I was and designing things at university, learning about natural dyes. Um, I've always sort of been interested in using scraps and one man's trash is another man's treasure kind of scenario. So along here, you can kind of see part of my process um, kind of from start to finish with one of my university projects. Um, I was interested in mark making on different textures, so not just fabrics. You see the top two left images are of a drain cover and a really rusty um, trailer that I saw. And then I was looking at these in different ways of mark making and seeing how I could transfer those onto fabric. So the other top row of images are pieces of fabric that I've hand dyed using rusted metals and how they can then be used for a t-shirt, for example, or some curtains. and then. The bottom row um, you can actually see bridal wear which is where towards my third year of university things kind of started to link up so when I mentioned that I was interested in embroidery when I started first year at university that just went completely out of the window and I was just so interested in all these other different mediums um, and towards my final year I decided to use sustainability and make do and mend and I looked back at my roots of what I was interested in and embroidery was one of them. So I thought, okay, how can I incorporate embroidery into sustainable practices? So these bottom row of images are of bridal wear pieces that I've found in charity shops and that I've regenerated myself by hand dyeing them or embroidering on top of them. So towards that sort of first collection that I created at university, um, Towards me finishing and graduating um, and ending, I decided to not stop this momentum that I was on. A lot of people finish university um, and sometimes they will decide to stop what they're doing um, or they're unsure. It, it can definitely be a confidence thing. Um, I would definitely recommend to just keep on doing what you enjoy. Um, and what I did, which really helped, was I kept giving myself um, like little bits of work to do so at uni we would be given a project to work on and a title for that and after I finished uni I decided to carry on doing that for myself so this collection here I created after I graduated I decided that I enjoyed the process so much that I wanted to try it again and sort of use different techniques that I've been learning and then through this I've started getting more bits of bridal wear, learning sort of how to repurpose them and how to maybe make them look less dated. Because normally if you find them in a charity shop, they're probably from the 80s, um, heavy polyester, like massive puffy sleeves and filled with like lots of gems. So I, I wanted to sort of make them a little bit more current to what they are now. And then, so through doing all of this, I, discovered that the whole process so these images that you're seeing um, are of me organizing photo shoots designing the backdrops um, sorting out different color palettes organizing the models and like, through this process I kind of discovered in myself that this was kind of the key element of what actually made me really excited so it wasn't necessarily the actual fashion or the garments it was more the interiors and the designing of the backgrounds so through doing this, I will then like to talk a little bit my 
work background as well as what was going on throughout my studies and university. I think it's quite important to highlight the work that goes on as well as being creative. Um, obviously we need to work for money and while I was at university and college um, I still carried on having jobs and um, continued working um, and when I first sort of started like in college and that I'd always see I'd be working in CAFs or different bits of hospitality and I think this is a good way to start just getting to know different work ethics and it's good for your timekeeping and you know learning how to work with other people is really really important. While I was at university I decided to get a job in a care home so I started specialising um, with people that were living with dementia and at the care homes I was asked to run different uh, creative activities because they knew that I enjoyed different creative mediums. So I wanted to figure out different things that would be really beneficial for the residents and one of them was flower arranging. And while I was learning, you know, different techniques of flower arranging, it was also quite, it tied in quite nicely actually to my studies of natural dye because they're quite tactile. Um, it's non-toxic, so it's good for people to touch. Um, it's very good for your senses. Um, so for smelling and visually it's beautiful as well, um, which is really good for people that are living with dementia and um, to have something that's really good for their senses. And at the time I was doing a wellbeing project at university. So I'm just trying to just mention how it can be quite important to bring all different aspects of your life into what you do um, for your course or your business. And then when I graduated from university, I continued being a carer for, I was a carer in total for about three and a half years. And I got to the point where I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit more textile based. Um, and while I was sort of searching, I found a job at an aircraft company um, as a sewing machinist. So I specialised in repairing bits of the aircraft and making pieces like seat belts um, that were made of textiles. So curtains, cushion covers. Um, and it was quite nice because it was a repairs company. So it still tied in a bit with my ethos of, you know, mending. And I learned actually a lot there on how to mend different types of fabrics and work with different materials that were completely out of my comfort zone. Um, I had like a toolbox and all different things and it was complete polar opposite to what I normally do, which is quite dainty and pretty fabrics and silks and sewing. Um, so that was actually quite a pivotal moment where I kind of learned how open the world of textiles is and how you know, at first I felt a little bit embarrassed to maybe get a job like that. Um, but if anything, it taught me so much. Um, so I think, you know, when you're looking for jobs after you might have done different courses um, to just try a bit of everything because you don't know which road it's going to take you down. And luckily now I've in a position where I've gone completely self-employed, which has happened this year, um, left the job at the aircraft place. And now I'm sort of working on my business full time. So part of what I do is teaching, which is obviously why I'm here today. Um, learning about different processes within textiles and all the different jobs that I've had. Um, I'm now in a position where I really like to share um, different things that you can do and how you can be more sustainable and use pieces that you might already have as something that can be regenerated into something more beautiful. Whilst I was at uni and working, um, I put this slide on because I just wanted to make it, um, well, I just wanted to talk to you about how getting yourself out there is quite important. So I started my business during my second year of uni. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I wanted to have a business. Um, I knew that I wanted to create things and that I wanted to work for myself. Um, I'm not too sure where that came from. I've just always really liked the idea of being my own boss. Um, but either working for someone else is brilliant as well because you learn so much um, and it's not as isolating. So to get myself out there more, I decided to do the things I absolutely love doing, which is going to festivals, um, going to different exhibitions and working on photo shoots. So I pushed myself quite a lot to apply for festivals, to do stands there exhibit my work at different places um, 
And through doing this, I met so many wonderful people. Um, and also through not doing this as well, um, there are quite a few places that said no or that I did a market stall for a whole day and I didn't sell one thing. Um, you know, it's important just to pick yourself back up again and understand that each time maybe that happens, that is still a lesson in itself of maybe what didn't work that time and how can you better it for next time. I've been very, very fortunate to have the opportunities now to teach all over um, and meet people from all over the world and show them different processes within the world of natural dye as well. Quite exciting um, going to festivals. Um, when I first started, I thought it was products sort of that I wanted to sell. And, you know, I was standing at a store for the entire day. And I actually learned that when I was there every single day, the thing that was most important was that I was talking to people about the processes and how things were dyed, um, how I made them. And it really taught me that maybe what I now do as my career is more service led, which means that I offer things that are can be taught or um, that people can use for different events instead of products. And that was quite important. Um, so it's quite interesting how different paths can lead you into different routes. And while I was working at festivals and different photo shoots, I kind of started leaning really towards the interiors side of things and being really intrigued as to how I could transform a space using textiles. Especially at festivals, you get incredible bits of decor. Um, I decided to do one of my university projects on festival decor. Um, and it's now really started sort of snowballing into what my business is today, which is heavily focused on fabric installations for events, especially weddings. Um, so here are a few more images as well of some of the work that I've recently been working on. Um, these are all wedding based um, for ceremonies, um, for walking down the aisle, little chill areas and dining as well. Um, and I like to sort of show people the importance of textiles and how beautiful they can be and how they can transform a space. All these bits of fabric have been regenerated or repurposed or gifted or they're organic. Um, and that's also such a nice story to talk to people about these things as well. And while I've been working sort of in the wedding industry and just craft and sustainability in general, um, I think it's quite important to use your voice for positive change and knowing what kind of industry you land yourself in, how you can make a difference and how you can make voices heard um, especially within the wedding industry, um, there's a lot of work that can be done. And I think it's just yeah, really important to have these conversations and start talking to people about what can be done um, just to amplify different people that aren't necessarily being seen in these spaces. Um, so I like to always make sure that I have a, a separate impact as well with the work that I do. You know, it's beautiful and it's pretty and it's textiles. But it's also great to be able to sort of have these conversations where we can educate people um, on how to better ourselves. So I kind of covered this a little bit when it came to sort of festivals and market stalls. It's something that I tell myself daily and that I always did when I was at college. I think one of my tutors actually told me this. It's like no one is going to know who you are unless you tell them. And I think that is so important because it well, it kind of it is what it is really, isn't it? If you're sitting at home and you're thinking about all the things that you might wanna be doing um, creatively or with your career, um, you know, you just need to put the wheels in motion. Nobody asked me to start my business or to make different things um, or to message them. I just decided to put myself in uncomfortable positions and really get myself out there with knocking on doors and yeah, even just messaging people on Instagram, asking them if, you know, I could maybe assist them on different like workshops or photo shoots. Um, and majority of the time, people were really, really lovely and always happy to help. The worst thing that's going to happen is that someone's going to say no, and then you move on from that. Um, so yeah, here's a few things that I find in really uh, important when it comes to sort of building um, what you want to do with your life. Um, so volunteering um, is amazing because you can meet different people. Um, you, you're sort of not getting too much invested 
that you can choose if it's something for you or if it isn't. Um, and then, yeah, going to industry events that might suit what you're interested in. So through doing all of this, um, I did some self-reflection and sort of decided, you know, what could I also do that would benefit myself and also benefit other people as well as, you know, as a whole when it comes to like building a brand. Um, and this is when I found myself working with another company uh, called Anthology Hire. Um, and they specialize in furniture hire um, for events and it's all vintage or handmade with reclaimed wood. So our ethos is uh, really well aligned. So through doing this and the reason that I mentioned them was I actually started working with them because I volunteered at photo shoots. Um, I put myself out there and we started seeing each other a lot at different events until we built up a relationship so much so that now we're technically business partners. Um, so I think, you know, it's really important to get yourself out there if that's something that you want to do. Um, and it really helps you meet other people and get to know them. So through doing that, a lot of my work comes through them now, um, which wouldn't have been the case if I'd never sort of put myself out there. And I just, uh, yeah, some lovely images of some work that I've recently been working on. Um, with working on photo shoots. So it got to the point where, you know, I've been volunteering and putting myself out there for collaborations um, and building up my portfolio. So the most important thing about, for me personally, working on photo shoots has been, you know, working with a team of people. So these images in themselves, you know, you've got the people that rent out the furniture, the florist, the cutlery, the crockery, the candles, the venue, the model, the hair and makeup artist, the dress designer, the jewellery designer, um, the photographer, the videographer, like the teams of people that come together to create pieces of artwork. Um, it is such a beautiful network and it's such a great way to get yourself out there and actually become friends with people in the same industry as you that you might be interested in. Um, and so through doing this, I now have built up a lovely network and community of people that I work with or that actually recommend me for paid jobs now. So now I'm kind of switching up what we're going to be doing today. That was kind of covering who I am, where I'm at, the work that I do um, and things that I'm interested in. So using sustainability and the whole make do amend mentality. Um, when I was at uni, I was always really interested in the art of kintoshingi. I'm sorry if I've pronounced that wrong, um, <laughs> but I've put it up there so you can sort of make a note of it if needs be. Um, it's a really old Japanese tradition um, where you have broken ceramics and instead of throwing them away, you actually highlight the beauty of them by filling up the cracks with gold. Um, and as you can see in itself, it's absolutely stunning. Um, and it's really just sort of a lovely testament to sort of saying that, you know, one man's trash really is another man's treasure. And another, so this kind of spiraled me into looking into sort of Japanese techniques. Um, they're historically known for beautiful textiles and different dye practices. So all of these blue colors that you see in this jacket um, have all been naturally dyed um, using a plant called indigo, which is a Japanese plant. Um, and it's mainly known for dyeing denim blue. And so the borrow technique in Japan, it's actually was made for, not made, it was kind of invented for people from a lower class system that weren't able to buy new clothing. So it was looked at as, as a, um, a status symbol. If you had to mend your clothes then people would look at you as lower class. And, um, and now people are reinventing that and putting a spin on it and sort of saying, well, it's actually really empowering to be able to mend your clothing and make a garment last so much longer, especially now that we're in the world where we are, where fashion is being reproduced so much so that, you know, we can't keep up with it and our planet is suffering because of it. Um, so learning different techniques on how to mend your clothing, um, I think is actually really important and can be really beautiful. Um, these images here are of one of my final pieces uh, that I've created. And it kind of celebrated um, natural dye and stitching and mark making and how, yeah, you can restore, recuperate, regenerate and repair something. And here are some other sort of examples um, of what 
we can do today and what I'll be showing you on different sort of stitching techniques. Um, and you can see like purses um, that you can make out of it. On the right here, I think it just looks so cool um, how you can just have a jumper that might have a few holes or like a few stains that you can't get out. And by doing different stitching techniques, um, you can actually make it into something completely unique and totally yours as well, um, which is really lovely to actually have a piece of clothing. Like I've got a skirt that I put in the washing machine and I think I loaded the washing machine a little bit too much. <laughs> um, so unfortunately it got loads of rips and holes in it and I was absolutely gutted because I love that skirt and it fitted me so well and just was really beautiful the way it hung. So I decided to mend it um, and it's got so many repairs in it. And now I just love it even more because it's not someone else's skirt that I've you know, got from a you know, charity shop or wherever. It's now completely mine because I put my stamp on it. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. I'm just gonna leave it on this screen and I'm just gonna stop. Let me see if I can go back down so I can see my hands, which might be a bit easier because we're gonna start doing the workshop now. So I think um, I think Sam has okay. There we go. Um, I think Sam has pinned the your hands for everyone. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, cool. So everyone should be able to see your hands. Okay, amazing. Cool. Um, just just so, just just to say quickly, um, if anyone does have any questions for me, please just pop them in the chat. We can. Um, um, I can. I'll happily relay any of those um, to Mia while she's uh, while she's working. Or um, if not, we'll, we've got a little bit of time at the end to ask some, ask some questions as well. So uh, if you do have any questions, just pop those in the chat. Um, Amazing. Well, thank you. over to you. Sorry. No, it's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. So um, I hope you can all see my hands okay. Um, as you can see, I've got a few examples here. Um, of pieces that haven't been mended, but different techniques that you can use um, for different stitch patterns. So here I've used a running stitch, which is a straight up and down stitch, which has got gaps in between it. Um, and this is just quite a nice stitch and we're gonna be doing this today. Um, and it's quite nice to use for mark making. Um, so you can see that on the background. Um, some other sort of ideas. Um, so we've got little stars here on the background and little polka dots as well, which are quite lovely. So what we're going to do today, we're going to mend a hole or whatever you might have um, at home. So I've got a little piece of fabric here just that I've got, which might be a little bit easier to see. Um, let me just bring that down a little bit closer. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So what I have got, I've got some scissors and I've got a needle. And I've got some thread. Um, I've actually got a pot of thread next to me, um, which I'm gonna potentially use. I think I'm just gonna use this dark color because it'll be most easier for you guys to see. Um, but if you have a bit of clothing that you have, or uh, maybe like a curtain or a tea towel or something that you're looking at repairing, um, <clears throat> then you know I'm assuming that you might have some thread at home. Um, if not, you know your mum or nan or one of your family members probably has got one of those really old biscuit tins that are filled with thread. <laughs> I know quite a few people have those lying around at home. Um, and, but and, and what I'm trying matter, to say is... Sorry, it doesn't matter whether it's embroidery thread or regular thread? No, not at all. Yeah, oh. it can be any type of thread. Um, if you are using embroidery thread, um, I would just make sure that you have an embroidery needle, um, which is basically the difference between that is um, the eye of the needle, which is where the hole is, um, is a lot bigger. Um, and because embroidery threads are quite thick, um, so you want to be able to fit it through. Um, so just make sure that you've got the right size needle and the right size thread um, and that it will fit through the hole on your needle. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to get my bit of fabric. So as you can see here, I've got some fabric which has got a hole in it. Um, so that might be a jumper or some socks or something that you might have at home. And then I've got a bit of fabric that I want to repair it with. So there's two different types of uh, words that can be used for repairing. Um, one of them is called applique. And applique is basically where you get another bit of fabric and you put it on top of the hole and then you stitch on top of that. 
And then there's reverse applique, which is where you put a bit of fabric underneath the hole um, and then you can stitch on top of it. What I'm going to first start with is putting this yellow bit of fabric underneath, um, just so it's a bit more clearer for you guys to see. Um, and yeah, so the first thing that you're going to do before you start any type of stitching, um, if you've got some pins, um, I've just got a little pot here, you might have one of those little pin cushions. Um, and I'm just going to put a pin in each corner of the fabric, just to make sure that it's secure. You don't want to pop it too close to the hole because um, when we start stitching, you don't want to get your fingers on it. But we will take them off after we've done a couple of stitches. So I'm just putting a pin in each corner. So there's four in total. And if you're doing it on a jumper or something, um, just imagine there's a, a square around the hole and um, that's about one or two inches away from the hole. So you can see here, that's the gap around the hole that I've got for where the needles are, uh, pins, sorry. So now that that's fastened down, I'm gonna get my needle and my bit of thread. And I'm gonna take about mm, between 30 and 60 centimeters of thread. You don't need too much. Um, the reason why we're just gonna do a little bit is because I have tried before to do a really, 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 really long piece of thread so that I didn't have to keep on re-threading it up again. Um, but because of that, it just gets really tangled and a little bit confusing. So I've got my needle in one hand and my thread in the other, whichever feels most comfortable, um, whether you're right handed or left handed. And I'm just going to thread this bit of cotton through the eye of the needle, which is where the hole is. Um, so I'm just going to pull that down. And what I do with the loose bit that you've just pulled through, I pull that down about halfway to the other piece. So you don't have to go all the way to the bottom. Um, some people like knotting them at the end. Um, you can do that if that's what you'd like. Um, it's not necessarily uh, needs to happen if you don't want to, um, just because you can keep the bit loose at the back of your fabric and the more stitching you do, it will eventually get completely fastened on there. So now that I've got my bit of thread up into the needle, I'm gonna pick up my piece of fabric with whichever hand feels most comfortable. And to secure this bit of fabric onto where the hole is, I'm gonna do four tiny little crosses in each corner of just about a centimeter or two centimeters away from the hole. And I'm gonna start by with pushing the needle from the bottom of the fabric upwards. So I'm just gonna come from the bottom up. And then I'm just going to pull the thread. I'm not going to come all the way out. If I turn that over, you see that's how much thread I've left loose. Um, if you did it a little bit more, then you've just got a little bit more of a worry that it might pull out and become unthreaded. Um, so I'm just going to do a teeny tiny little cross. I'm just going to go back down, pointing the needle downwards through the fabric and then back up again through the fabric and across that first little mark that I made. So I'm just gonna bring that a little bit closer just so you can see that tiny little cross that I've done there. So I'm gonna repeat that and do it three more times in about a centimeter away from the hole. Um, and I'm not gonna cut the thread underneath. I'm not gonna start a new piece. I'm just gonna keep on going with the long bit of thread that I've already got on the needle. And I wouldn't worry too much um, about making this even. It's just quite nice to just get the fabric secured onto there. And if you're thinking that you might not want to do a cross, um, you can just do a single stitch. But I'm just going to do crosses for now because they do look quite pretty. Um, and they can be blended in quite nicely with different patterns that you might want to do. So I'm just doing the final cross now. And if you feel that the other bit of thread that's loose um, getting tied up with your other piece of thread, um, I would just pull it through a little bit just so it doesn't get caught. And so now that I've done all four, you can see right here, I've got one, two, three, four little dark crosses in each corner of where the hole is. 
And if I turn it over, you can see that the thread is a bit here, there and everywhere. Um, just like a little map of where I've been. Don't worry about that too much. Because um, when we start stitching a little bit more on top, um, you can either cut those pieces if it's something you're going to be wearing um, once the uh, stitching is sort of more heavily on top. Um, or you can just keep it as it is. Um, it doesn't normally get too caught. So where my bit of thread currently is, I'm going to carry on with my needle. I'm going to come from the bottom upwards. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a running stitch. So I'm basically going to stitch from one corner to the other. And I'm just going to repeat this process going across the fabric, just where the hole is. And it's quite nice, actually, when you get into a rhythm of it. You don't have to worry about it being completely neat. I personally love seeing a mend that is just completely wobbly, a little bit messy, because it's part of your personality. And, you know, practice makes perfect as well. And it's quite nice seeing something that's got a bit of character in it. You know, when we're mending things, um, it's nice to be mindful that it's not going to be a perfectly manufactured product um, because that's why we're all here, because <laughs> we want to learn how to be more sustainable. So we've just had a, um, a question um, from mm -hmm. Precious. Uh, they've asked, do we have to use two different fabrics? And I'm assuming if you've got fabric that's similar to the thing you're mending, mm -hmm. um, you could use that as well and make it a bit less visible. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Depending on like, you know, your personal style, um, what you're repairing. Like I've got um, some denim jeans and I've put a bit of denim underneath them and then put the mm. stitching on top. Um, it depends if you want to make it obvious or not. Um, but yeah, definitely. It's quite fun, actually. I had another top that I repaired. Um, and instead of using like a similar fabric or a similar colour, I used like a mesh bit of fabric. So it actually had like a little kind of see-through bit of fabric um, peeping through where the hole was, um, which was Brilliant. pretty cool as well. So um, yeah, literally just have fun with it. Um, whatever your personal style is, just experiment. I actually buy jeans from charity shops just so I can cut them up to fix other pairs of jeans. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> That's such a good idea. <laughs> um, what's your favourite mend that you've ever done? Oh, my favourite mend. Mm. Probably had to be a wedding dress um, that I got from a charity shop. I'm still completely surprised that I even found it in a charity shop. It was head to toe, um, pure silk, and it it's just absolutely stunning. And it had quite a few holes in it. Um, wow. So I completely like stitched the whole top bust bit. I hand dyed it with um, rusted metals and I, I left it to sit for about six months. So it was really like a labor of love. Um, wow. <laughs> um, someone someone else has just put in the chat do we have to single stitch diagonally I just wonder if you could hold up what you're doing just to so, the camera so we can see I'm just going in one direction and then after I've done that direction I'm just going to go in the opposite direction so it goes across the hole um you're more than welcome to do any other type of stitch you know you can do lots of little crosses all over it which is pretty cool um or we can do like little circles. I've got actually a purse here and let me show you, um, which has got some different types of stitches that I've done. So like circles here. So you can sometimes if you can do it freehand, which is, you know, great. Or if you're a little bit worried and it's something that you really love and you want it to be a really nice, neat repair, um, then you can just get some fabric chalk or fabric pens and just draw your uh, circles or design underneath um that's the other side so it's more of like the running stitch that you can sort of see here um and another cool thing about using fabric pens and that that's actually what i've used to make these um mm. so i haven't done those freehand i've drawn them down first are they the ones that kind of like so rub out I was the... sorry yeah you go ahead yeah, yeah, so they can rub out or you can wash them after. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably recommend actually using fabric chalk instead of pen 
Um, yeah. If you're using lighter colours, that is, but if you're using something darker, then that's okay. But um, I'm just going to stop this stitch because I'm guessing you guys get the gist of that going up and down, back and forth. Something I was also going to show you, which is kind of another nice idea um, to sort of make even more of a feature of the hole. Like if you don't want to be shy and be like, OK, cool, I've made a hole in this. I'm not ashamed of it. Take a look. So here, as you can see, this bit of fabric was actually from uh, a napkin and it's been completely burnt from candle. And I've got a couple of bits of fabric here. I've just chosen colours that are a little bit more visible for you guys to see. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to decide, because there's two holes there. So one of them, you could do something like this. We could do one shape. So I was like, OK, cool. I could put like a rectangle here. And then on top of that, with the other bit of pink that I have, I'm going to cut out... I love her. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Lovely. I'm just doing this freehand, so no judgment, <laughs> please. <laughs> My heart cutting skills. It's quite nice, actually, if you've got bits that you need to mend that you can just sort of sit either in front of the telly or listening mm. to some music, and it's just you kind of zone out a little bit and it's um it's actually really nice a bit of mindfulness so as you can see here i can put this love heart on top of the hole and then start if i get my needle again and then just start stitching that on top but this time i might do little crosses and see what that looks like if you're using multiple bits of fabric, um, just be mindful of pinning them down um, and just mind your fingers as well while you're stitching. I was just thinking about your question, Emma, um, with one of the my most favourite things that I've mended yes. and also one of the largest things that I've mended was um, actually a cover for an aircraft <laughs> at one of my old jobs so literally an entire huge bit of fabric it was one of the biggest repairs I've probably ever done <laughs> what? so yeah I've got my little love heart and then that bit of fabric and I'm just going to fold that just to make it a little bit thicker did you do some nice pretty embroidery on the aircraft um cover? <laughs> I should have shouldn't I <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> going on your Ryanair flight <laughs> so yeah what I'm doing on this one now I'm actually just stitching little crosses on top of the heart and just sort of making a feature of the hole and sometimes this can look really nice um yeah on like whichever sort of thing that you are repairing um I think that's what's so fun about this is that whatever your personal style is like if you're you know into your minimal kind of like structured clothing then you can do like very subtle like if you wear like all white all the time then you can do like tiny little remains with white bits of thread which can look really subtle but when someone notices it or if you notice it it's always quite a nice talking point mm. um or vice versa like if you love your patterns and your color then just go wild and clash and do all of it um but yeah just have some fun and if I you do continue to do pieces hmm Sorry, carry on. No, no, I was just going to say, if you do do any bits at home or yeah, bits of textiles, then definitely tag me in the pieces you make because I'd love to see them. Um, I was just going to say, I guess it's uh, it's quite a nice way to, even if you don't have a hole in something, to make mm -hmm. something a bit more you. So yeah. like uh, we live in a world where actually like a lot of the same clothes are being produced by by companies and you know however you do get your clothes um you can make them a bit more individual by mm -hmm. um you know thinking oh well I'd really like a little embellishment here or there or I'd really like a little um pop of color on this uh and then yeah. that item of clothing is then yours and not the same as everyone else's that's so nice or even putting yeah like a little note on I mm. work with this lady um in the wedding industry and she specializes in um so she makes veils um 
and also like jackets so like you know some couples wear denim jackets or leather jackets and you know it could be quite edgy and cool or if you want to have like a veil um, and what she does is she stitches um like love letters onto the bits oh. of fabric um which is just really lovely and it makes it that much more personal and what's even more beautiful um is that she actually does it in the person's handwriting as well oh so she magic prints yeah it's just it's really lovely oh so yeah that's another thing to think of um i know i showed you like a few bits of writing that i'd done um but you could even yeah put like a little memo on your jacket feed the cat <laughs> or something <laughs> <laughs> Bring it work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's also nice, like a present for someone, if you want to get someone like a little, mm. you know, maybe like a cushion or something, and you can write a little message on there for them or a date. Or I've uh, done ribbons for people's bouquets for their weddings before, and I've I've written their um their grandparents' names or someone that wasn't Aww. able to be there, so they've got a bit of them with them. <sighs> You're gonna make me cry. Oh. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you can you just see that little love heart and a few little cross bits on there um, a little bit of fabric um, and yeah I'm just going to pop my other screen on so you can see me um, we're sort of concluding the end of that hello <laughs> <laughs> very so, nice yeah. That um, is mending and stitching and all the fun bits. Rowan's just put in the chat, um, I embroidered an old denim shirt in the first lockdown, a few stitches every day. If you've got a picture oh. of that, uh, tag us on the, um, yeah. Um, so we've got, oh, real. we've got uh, about 15, 20 minutes for some questions. So uh, I think, are you going to carry on doing a bit of stitching while we um, ask questions, Mia? Bro. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone yeah, does, does have any questions, um, we can ask those now. I will, uh, I have got a few written down, but I'll, I'll let you ask yours first. And um, <laughs> So someone's put, how can I connect with Mia personally? Um, I think you're going to share your Instagram. Yeah, let me, yes. if I just go back on where I was at. Do, do, do. Can you see that? Yep. So that's Mia's email, that's Mia's Instagram. Um, so you can get in touch by those methods. Um, <laughs> I know you've uh, you've kind of said, you've kind of given a bit of advice on um, uh, what, what you'd kind of say to someone who was wanting to get into this industry. Um, is there mm. anything else you'd, you'd mention around that? Um, About, about um, if if uh, if anyone watching today wanted to get into into uh, this kind of thing in the future, is there any mm -hmm. advice you could you could give them? I would definitely recommend speaking with people, connecting with people, um, putting yourself out there. Like I think I mentioned that you know people mm. are of the most part really lovely and always willing to help. Um, I did a lot of like volunteering and work placements at different textile companies. Um, and I tried to find people that sort of had similar practices of things that I was interested in. Um, and just, yeah, to make sure that you are completely yourself. I know that sounds super cheesy and cliche and a lot of people say that, but if you are just authentically yourself, then like I'm a massive believer that your vibe attracts your tribe and mm. by putting out the sort of energy that you want to sort of do you will meet people that share similar values and mindsets and enjoy the same things that you enjoy mm. um so yeah like you know i would go sort of on instagram or pinterest you know sort of fall down a pinterest rabbit hole sometimes um yeah. but it can lead you to some amazing artists and creators um, whether you find their website or Instagram, like I would normally just drop them a message 
um just be completely honest I'd normally be like hi you know I'm Mia I'm you know love what you do really interested in like your whole processes and that um like you know either would you maybe be free to like meet up for a cup of tea or something or like you know could you maybe answer some questions um or have you got any like projects or work that you need some help with um so I would always really sort of put myself out there um, mm. and it is daunting and it's quite scary sometimes um, but pretty much all the people that I now work with have either been contacted that way or they've contacted me that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really nice. Um, Poppy's put in the chat, how can you make sure it's machine washable with paint and dye, etc.? I'm, I'm assuming you mean the, the natural dyes. Um, is that, are those, you know, if like you spoke about the wedding dress that you left in a, in you left it in for six months like how do you can you can you wash that afterwards or is that just like a, you can wear it once and so with natural dyes this is actually quite a common question that I get asked mm -hmm. um and one of the main things that I sort of like to mention is that um every like fashion and textile museum that you go to um over 90% of all of those items have been naturally dyed. Um, it wasn't until like, the chemical dye revolution that came in um, that found a cheaper and cheaper way of dyeing our fabrics mm. and textiles, which is um, what we find ourselves in now, which is not very sustainable. Um, and wearing chemically dyed items, um, you know, our skin is our largest organ. So it's um, quite interesting how, you know, our bodies can also react to different types of dye. But yeah, so in answer to your question, um, they do stand the test of time. They need a little bit more love and care than what your normal clothing or textiles would. Um, so I would always just put them in a cold wash um, or depends what you've dyed them with. Um, so the thing that I left for about six months had been rust dyed. Um, mm -hmm. So when you dye things with rusted metals, it like oxidizes the fabric and it's like super hardy um and like really robust and it pretty much never washes out so that's absolutely fine and you can do that on any type of material um with natural dyeing in itself you need to make sure that you are using natural fabrics so whether that be like cotton hemp viscose uh, cellulose fiber silk uh wool um you have to use a natural fabric if you want to use natural dyes um, and you have to pre-treat the fabric as well before you dye it so if I bought a cotton t-shirt and then just hand dyed it with some natural dye that I've made, um, yeah, you're right, it would wash out. So you mm. have to pre-treat the fabric, um, which is a process called pre-mordanting. Um, it's the Latin word, which means to bite. So um, you use a different Brilliant. ingredient. <laughs> so yeah, you use different ingredients to um, soak the fabric in before you then dye it. And then this means that the color will last a lot longer. Yeah. Lovely. Um, there's a question from Liv. If you have a lot of old items that are ragged beyond just mending a hole, do you have any recommendations on what to do with those? I thought of making a rug, but with various old clothing cuttings, but any other ideas? A rug sounds lovely. Nice. Love that. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, I've made quite a few, if you, um, I'm assuming that you might mean a rag rug. Um, I've made a couple of those and yeah you literally just tear up loads of bits of fabric um, and you get some hessian fabric and you buy like um, you have to buy a specific tool for it it's like a little wooden hook um, and it helps you like thread those bits of fabrics within the gaps of the hessian so then you can let them fluff out at the end and yeah make mm. like a rag rug and um, that's super fun um, mm. and I pretty much did that for everybody's Christmas presents uh, the other year <laughs> um, out of loads of old clothes other things that you can make out of old clothing. Um, so you could do like tassel bunting. You could make a quilted duvet or a cushion. You could make a purse or a bag, or you could patchwork loads of bits of fabrics together to make a scarf, um, curtains. I normally look at other things that are textiles, um, and just sort of think, OK, what could I use for those items to then make something new? Um, I know a lady that I worked with once and for her wedding. Um, she got in the invites, she asked everybody to 
um, get a little bit of scrap bit of fabric or clothing that they had and to make a tiny little square bit of patchwork. So when they arrived to the wedding, they then all gave her this little bit of stitched patchwork that they did. And then she then sewed it into a huge quilt, which is called her marriage quilt, <laughs> which is just amazing. My, my mum had a patchwork quilt that she'd made um, and it had all of our um, all of our clothes in from when we were young. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so all of our baby clothes were put into the patchwork and we'd be like, oh, that was our sock from, you know, when, when we fell over that day. Oh, that's amazing. Our, yeah, it was really cool. Um, I love that. Also, you could use the old clothing to fix other clothes. Yeah. And you can also, if it's something that, like, you really like... Um, like maybe it's got like a really nice pattern and you're like, oh, I love that pattern, but I don't know what to do. Um, what I've done before is you can just cut like a square out and then just frame it. <laughs> which nice. pretty cool. I've also but yeah, there's this old... Um, so, hmm? You go ahead. There's this um, Japanese proverb um, and it's basically, if you have a bit of fabric small enough to wrap a single bean in it, then it's big enough for you to keep. <laughs> so keep a little box of all your scrap fabrics for repairs and little projects and that. <laughs> I've also um, taken clothes apart when they're beyond repair and mm -hmm. traced out the pattern so that I can- Yeah, you make it again. Make it again. Um, Cause sometimes you buy like yeah. something that's really nice and then you wear it to death and then it's, it's, it's done. And yeah. you're like, oh, well I, they don't make this anymore. So yeah. I'm just gonna make it myself. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Someone's and it's always crochet. fairly straightforward, isn't it, with garments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, if you have something that's like complete, like you said, really ragged and really bad. So say like the entire sleeve is just absolutely ruined. You could get another bit of item that's also ruined and just make a completely new sleeve for that mm -hmm. item, which would be mm -hmm. pretty cool. Yeah, out of another item of clothing that, you know, mm. it's also... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, someone's put you could crochet into it. That's a nice idea. Um, yeah, yeah, you can crochet into it. Precious has asked, what ingredients do you use to make it last longer? I'm assuming you mean with For the, the remodeling. Yeah. So there is a variety of ingredients that you can use. Um, the one that I use, which is, I personally think is, after all the different sampling and things that I've done, it's the most, uh, what's the word, uh, durable, sustainable, um, cost effective. Um, it's called alum um, and it's a natural rock salt. Um, if you've heard of like natural deodorants, um, then they're all made out of this thing called alum. Um, and it's just like, it looks like a massive block of salt. Um, and it is technically like a natural rock salt. Um, and you can either buy it in crystal form and you dissolve it into hot water, or you can buy it in powdered form. Um, and yeah, you dissolve that into water as well. Um, yeah, if you're interested in like the quantities of how much you need per fabric, then you're more than welcome to message me or there's lots online. Um, other ingredients that you can use um, that are quite popular, um, people use soya milk. And um, the reason why I don't use soy milk is because soybeans are quite unsustainable. Mm. Um, and buying lots of cartons of milk at the supermarket just to leave soaking in a bucket, um, it just gets a bit smelly in that. Whereas alum, <laughs> it's literally you just dissolve it in water and you can keep that water as well. Um, and it doesn't go off and it doesn't smell or um, other things that you can use. So anything that are high in tannins, um, so pomegranate skins, you can soak those and use those to soak the fabric in. Um, some metals you can use, so yeah, aluminium. Um, funny, actually, in Norwich, um, they used to be the main distributor of textiles into the UK mm -hmm. before London was the main yeah, importer um, area. Um, and Norwich is famous for its red. So it has, the Norwich shawls have all been hand dyed with red, uh, an ingredient called madder, which mm -hmm. is a type of wood. Um, and if you go to the uh, the Bridewell Museum in Norwich, um, they've got all the shawls on display. Um, but what they did in Norwich, because there's like a pub for every day of the year, they'd have um, 
a competition. <laughs> One of the oldest and most natural mordants you can use for your fabric to set it is urine. <laughs> I've never tried it. Um, I don't know if I would. I don't think people would be that excited to know that the bits of fabric at a wedding have been soaked in my urine. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if I were to ever use it, obviously it's the most natural and it's, you know, constant resource of it as well. You know, you're never going to run out. Um, but basically in Norwich, they had a competition with all the pubs about who could produce the deepest red colour with the dye over what urine was collected from the pubs. Um, this was like back in like the 1500s or something. Bro. But um, I always found that quite funny to know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that the um, the Madder Market is named after the dye. Um, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, ah, this is lovely. Uh, Marty has put, I've loved everything about this course, Mia. Unfortunately, I've got to do, leave early. I look forward to being provided the link to the recording to engross myself further. That's lovely. Aww, that's um, really lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, so if, if anyone does have any more questions, um, just pop those in the chat. Uh, I do have some things to go over before we do end the session. Um, I'm going to come back on then. Wait a couple more minutes to see if there's any more questions. Um, so yeah, you can see, obviously, I haven't actually decided to make this neat or anything. Can you, is my, can you still see what my other camera? Um, I can't. I don't know if Sam's unpinned it or. Oh. Oh no, it's um, it's died. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll show it on here. So it's wow. not the neatest thing in the world. I haven't actually followed a certain direction, um, but I think it looks pretty cool. And you can exactly. choose whether like how heavily you want to stitch. So maybe like in the circle, you could do like no stitching and then go really mm. far out and do loads. Um, but yeah, so that would look super cool on a bit of clothing or something. Um, and I guess you could yeah. change like the, you could even get like a heavier thread for the outside circle and then like a lighter thread for the inside circle. Yes, mm -hmm. all the ideas. <laughs> all the, ideas. <laughs> the options are endless as well. It's so much fun. Cool. Um, Lovely. So I'm going to um, I'm going to start wrapping things up. Um, before we do finish today, I just want to remind everyone um, that we do have a wide range of workshops across the summer school. Um, so there are three workshops left. Um, you will be able to access these uh, recordings. You you can access recordings of live sessions, or you can can join us for the live events. Um, so the the ones happening next week are covering learning the art of asking questions with Amy Shaw, directing frame to frame and skills for promoting drag culture with Drag Guru Lib. So all of our workshops are designed to give you an insight into lots of different areas that your creativity could take you and suggest at the many jobs that do exist. If you haven't already, you can book your place for the next three workshops um, on our website and we will, I think, send you the link in the chat right now. We are also offering you the opportunity to receive an official NUA certificate, which is great to talk about in any of your UCAS personal statements that you might be putting together. Um, to get a hold of one of these certificates, you'll need to attend six of the 12 workshops, and we want to see your outcomes from at least three of these workshops. Please be aware that any work that you do submit may be used in future promotional information for the series. Um, we do need to have this by the 6th of September, I believe. Um, please, you can send these outcomes to us by email at student.recruitment at nua.ac.uk. Um, that email address will also go into the chat. So these outcomes can be something you've made as part of the workshop or something you've made afterwards in response to one of the workshops. We also really wanna see what you're making throughout the summer school series. So do tag us in any of your photos of your workshop outcomes on Instagram at NUA Outreach and at Take Your Place underscore HE. We'll be sharing some of our favorite pieces throughout the series. So um, do get involved. We will put that email address in the chat right now, um, as along with the Instagram links. Each week we'll also be giving away a Chili's bottle and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is to complete the feedback form we'll be sending you by email at the end of each week. So to close, 
thank you so much Mia for the workshop today and thank you to everyone for joining us I hope you've had You're as welcome. much fun as I have I've really enjoyed it I've actually just noticed another question ah let me Ah, oh, I've done textiles GCSE and I'm about to start my A-level course. Any advice to stay motivated and keep inspired? That's a really good question. So something that I help keep motivated um, is keeping a little notebook, um, just like a little tiny one that I can fit sort of in my bag. And like anything that I would do or if I would be out and I'd see something that I'd like, I would even just write it down. I can make a little note of it or maybe do a little drawing of it. Um, or if you see something, you know, that you can, you're allowed to take. Um, so sometimes I would find a flower, I would snip it and then just tape it in the little book. Um, that helped me keep inspired because I started getting excited about how I could make this little sketchbook look really cute and sort of keep it as like a little document of things that I enjoyed or things that made me happy. Um, so keep inspired, like look outwards from what you normally do. So like, obviously look at your main passions and the things that you're interested in. Um, but a lot of things that I sort of found inspiration from were things like maybe like old buildings um, from the marks that were made on like rusted bits of drain covers. Um, and yeah, just try and look at the world as like your playground and um, try and not be like, uh, what's the word? try not to look at something um, negative if you don't like it. So when I was doing GCSEs, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of science. Um, and now that I specialize in natural dye, um, it is a science in itself. Um, you have to learn different recipes and use different uh, ingredients and things like that. Um, so yeah, definitely keep your eyes open and yeah, be open to learning different things. Um, just so everyone knows, uh... We do have a Padlet board for you to share your work. Um, so if you did want to share what you have mended today, um, we'd love to see it. I am going to put the link for that in the chat for you right now. Um, someone else has just put, hey Mia, I think you're wonderful. You've given me the confidence to try something different, new and just something crazy. I love the presentation and was really moved by your journey and learned a lot. We'll surely put them to use in the future. That is really lovely. Your choice. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciate it. So yeah, and yeah, depending see... on um, whoever's watching and uh, your year and things like that of where you're at, I do also offer work internships, but it's normally for university. Um, so obviously, that just bear that in mind if you're ever interested in learning uh, different things at the studio. Well exciting times um and please do you know please do share mm -hmm. share your work with us we'd, we'd love to see it um mm -hmm. exciting thank you everyone really appreciate you all spending your time with me and learning a bit more about sustainable textiles lovely if that's i think that's everything so i'm going to end the session um, thank you mia uh and I hope oh, we'll, we'll see you all in the next summer school session. Bro. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Bye.